Welcome to this program on the Blessed Virgin Mary and the Holy Eucharist. I'm standing before the Milk Grotto Church because St. Augustine wrote so long ago that she gave milk to our bread. We hope that you'll be able to better understand the love of Jesus Christ and His Blessed Mother in the Holy Eucharist as we reflect on the ways she helps us to appreciate the great gift that Christ gave us in the Eucharist and that our own devotion to her will draw us ever closer to Jesus our Lord. This is all the Pool of Bethesda, but you notice that there is a large structure inside of it. The structure is a Crusader church to commemorate Jesus healing the man at the Pool of Bethesda, the man who had been paralyzed for 38 years. But we also see that there's a wall. Why did they build there? Because there already was a wall at the pool that had been under the water at the time of Christ, but we now have drained it all out, and we see the wall, and you see some of the plaster still on it. This wall, according to the archaeologists, goes back to the 8th century B.C. That is exactly the time of Isaiah the prophet. And it's very important for us to note that Isaiah the prophet gave one of his most famous prophecies here. And we see that in Isaiah chapter 7. When Ahaz, the son of Yotham, the son of Uzziah, was the king of Judah, Rezin, the king of Aram, which is Syria, and Pekah, son of Remaliah, the king of Israel, they went up to Jerusalem to make war against her. However, they were unable to fight the war. The house of David was told, Aram, that is Syria, has rested with Ephraim, which is northern Israel. His heart shuddered, and the heart of his people fluttered like the trees of the forest before the wind. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go meet Ahaz. You and your son, remnant, will return, Sha'ar Yashuv at the end of the conduit of the upper pool, at the highway of the fuller's field. Say to him, be on guard and keep quiet. Fear not, and do not let your heart be weak on account of these two stumps of firebrands. Their plan will not stand and will not happen. Then the Lord said again to Ahaz, ask for a sign from the Lord your God for yourself. Let the request be deep or high above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not test the Lord. Then Isaiah said, Listen, house of David, is it too small for you to weary men that you may so weary my God? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. She will call his name Emmanuel. Curds and honey he will eat when he knows how to refuse evil and choose good. For before the lad knows how to refuse evil and choose good, the land will forsake its two kings whom you dread. So Isaiah meets the king as they are plastering this wall here because this king of Syria and the king of northern Israel was attacking Jerusalem in the year 735 B.C. And as they attack the city, they're going to need water for the siege. So that's why he's repairing it. And it's here that instead of worrying about this kind of military and practical preparation, the Lord promises a sign that a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us.
We're standing inside the grotto of the Incarnation, or the grotto of the Annunciation. The Annunciation, of course, refers to the announcement of the birth of Jesus by the angel Gabriel. The Incarnation focuses more on God's side. This is what God did. He became flesh by the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary. I would like to bring out in this place, this is one of the most holy places in the world for all of Christianity, the place where the Word was made flesh, just as it says here under the altar, verbum caro hic factum est, here the Word was made flesh. This is extremely important for understanding the role of Mary and the Eucharist, because it's in this place that she is invited to be able to become the mother of the Son of God. And she doesn't understand how it will happen. Notice the difference in her question from the question of Zechariah. Zechariah asked, how will I know this will happen? He wanted proof. Mary wants to know, how will this happen? In other words, what must I do? She's just trying to follow along orders that she doesn't understand yet. He wants evidence. Very big difference. And this brings out another aspect of Mary and the Eucharist. Let's take a look at these two points. First, the Word becomes flesh here. That this great saying, that the Word became flesh at this spot, means that here, God the Son was conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary. And in answer to her question, how will this be, the angel Gabriel says, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. And Christ becomes flesh. Now this is extremely important for understanding the Eucharist because Jesus truly took on human flesh. Remember he said in John chapter 6 that unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you cannot have eternal life. Here, Jesus takes on human flesh. This is where it actually becomes possible for us to receive His flesh in the Eucharist because unless He had flesh, He couldn't give it to us. He couldn't transform bread and wine into His body and blood unless He first had a body and had blood. And what's also very important about this mystery is that our Lord was not play-acting the way Greek gods did. The Greek deities would take human shape and then go back to being gods. And when they took human shape in that way, it was usually to cause trouble for human beings. When God takes on flesh here in this place, it's not to cause mischief, but it's to end our mischief and bring us reconciliation with God. This is a tremendous difference. Now, there was a theologian, a deacon, who lived in France named Berengarius. And he lived in the 11th century A.D. He was the first theologian we know of to deny the real presence of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. When the Pope and the various bishops and other theologians argued with Berengarius, what they said again and again and again as proof against him is that the flesh of Jesus Christ that we receive in the Holy Eucharist is the same flesh that was conceived in the womb of the Virgin, that died on the cross, and that was raised from the dead. There is one other aspect that relates to this spot in terms of Mary and the Eucharist. Our Lady is a woman of faith. And her faith had many different aspects which we will discuss as we go to different places throughout this country. Her faith that led her to go down and believe the word of the angel Gabriel, and then she went and she visited Elizabeth, who in her old age had become pregnant. And she believed in God and went down to Bethlehem, and then she had her birth there, the birth of her son there. And the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem is going to be something that required her to be part of a journey of faith, a pilgrimage of faith. And they went into Egypt, and then they came back to Nazareth. One journey after another, 
that are all part of her journey of faith, her pilgrimage of faith. But there is something else that we share with her and the Eucharist. In this spot, when the angel Gabriel said to Mary that you will conceive and have a son, and he explains that it will be by the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit, which, by the way, is also connected to the Eucharist, isn't it? Because we priests always extend our hands over the bread and wine to pray for the coming down of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit has to change the bread and the wine into the body and blood of Christ. It's not my personal power. It's the power of God. And the same Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary in this spot so Christ could be conceived in her. But then, just as in the Eucharist, we see God acting by the word of Jesus, this is my body, this is the cup of my blood. And by the coming of the Holy, Holy Spirit, the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit, we see one other thing. At every Eucharist, as we finish up the Eucharistic prayer, the priest will lift up the body and blood of Christ and say, through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father. And everybody says... Amen. Amen. One word, we summarize our faith. In this same spot, Our Lady is the model for summarizing a faith that not only believes what God said, but is also willing to act on it. Because in Aramaic, the word let it be, it takes three words in English, but not in Aramaic. In Aramaic, it's one word, Nehwe. So she responded to the angel's invitation and promise of conceiving a son by the power of the Holy Spirit with a one-word act of faith, Nehwe. And then she followed. She followed every step of the way, even when the journey took her to Calvary. So also, we respond to the Eucharist with one word of faith, Amen. Believing all that was said and then being willing to take the Eucharist as the way that strengthens us to live our journey, our pilgrimage of faith, and giving our lives to Christ. Not only in believing the doctrines of the faith, but also having faith so that we are committed to Christ no matter where He may lead us or how He may lead us. So in this way, Our Lady is doubly connected to the Eucharist here. He takes on flesh in this place, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and Jesus calls us to an act of faith in one word, as he did his own mother. We have this reading from the Gospel of St. Luke of the Annunciation of the birth of Jesus, Annunciation made to Our Lady, in the town of Nazareth. However, we are not in Nazareth at this point. We're on Mount Nebo. This is the place on which Moses died. Moses was, of course, the great lawgiver. He's the one who received this word of God on Mount Sinai, a word that is so crucial for understanding all of salvation history. He received the Ten Commandments. Along with those commandments, many other laws of how we are to regulate our lives. Laws of what it means to be moral. Laws which give living in the land of promise a sense of dignity that comes from the way human beings relate to each other well or not. In addition to laws about how we are to relate with each other, Moses received many other instructions on how to build the tabernacle in which Israel is to worship God. Along with those instructions, he oversaw the completion of the building of the tabernacle. And it's very interesting how in the very last chapter of the book of Exodus, seven times it says God had said these things and Moses did what the Lord had told him to do. And the number seven should not be taken as an insignificant number. 
in some ways, just as Moses and the people of Israel are constructing the tent in which to meet God and to offer sacrifice and to praise God with the Psalms, they are also, in a certain way, making an important connection between their worship and the creation. Creation happened in seven days. Hence, seven times Moses' line is repeated that everything the Lord said, he did. Just as the Lord did whatever he chose to do on the seven days of creation. And so making that connection with Moses is very important because this becomes the very core of the word of God which Israel was given. And Moses was told to write these things down. He wrote down the Ten Commandments. He wrote down the other laws. He wrote down the instructions on how to build the temple and also the instructions that after building of the temple, the instructions in the book of Leviticus on how to celebrate the sacrifices, how to celebrate the feasts of the people of Israel feast that the Lord had commanded them to do. And so Moses is the great lawgiver. That's also a reason, of course, why Moses appears with Elijah on the Mount of the Transfiguration. Moses gave the law, and the law testifies to Jesus, just as Elijah gave prophecy and the prophets testify to Jesus. So that's another very important connection, that that law is still known to us. It still is the Bible, not only of the people of Israel, but the Bible for the new Israel, for the church. Christians look to the same Torah as the inspired word of God, and we say in our creed that the Lord has spoken through the prophet. And because the Lord spoke to the prophets, we accept this as the word of God. This is very important for us to remember who we are, where we come from. And we cannot have mass. We do not celebrate the mass at all without having the word of God spoken to us. Every single Eucharist includes the gospel. Every Eucharist includes readings from the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Psalms, the prophets, the histories, and of course, the letters of St. Paul and Acts of the Apostles and the other writings of the New Testament. This reading of Scripture is as much at the very core of what we do when we celebrate Mass as the reading of Scripture was at the core of the celebrations in synagogues and also in the temple. So we have to remember this. Now, how does that connect with the Blessed Virgin Mary and the Eucharist? Today's gospel of the Annunciation by the angel is something only the Blessed Virgin Mary knew. There's no other witness. No one else is there. No one was alongside her taking notes. And this means that we can only know these episodes about the birth of Jesus and also the birth of John the baptizer. We can only know these things because it was in her memory. She remembered these things. And she passed those memories on to the apostles. When the apostles had gone back to Jerusalem, after the time of the ascension of Jesus, they were told to wait and pray. And St. Luke says in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, that among them were a number of disciples, including some women, and then he mentions by name, and the mother of Jesus was with them too. She spent time with the church community. 
And in that time, and times afterwards, with the community, as she stayed with John, remember, he took her into his home. And they stayed there in Jerusalem for some years. In that time of Mary being with them, she would have told them this story of what happened to her when the angel Gabriel appeared and invited her to receive the word of God. He invites her to become the mother of the Son of God. He announces to her something that would seem impossible by nature, namely that a virgin would conceive and bear a son. And yet that also was in the words of the prophet. That's in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. And so these words of what the angel Gabriel spoke to Mary, these words which she heard and then her conversation with him are all things that we know about because of her memory. She brought this to mind. And this is something that is inherent in what we do at every Mass, isn't it? At every Eucharist, we are remembering again all those great deeds of God. We remember these in the readings themselves that we have from Scripture, such as this Gospel of the Annunciation. We also, in the prayers, recall the great events that God gave us. We remember them. We call them to mind. Both when the priest is saying some of the prayers and the Eucharistic prayer, or when we're responding. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the death of the Lord. We are remembering the great deeds of God. This is inherent in the Mass. And whenever we do so, we are being like the Blessed Virgin Mary, who had stored all of these words in her heart. She meditated on these things that happened to her. And because she meditated on them, because she stored them up in their, her heart, we know about them. So also must we do to be like her. We must take all these words of God, and truly put them in our hearts and remember them, not only here at Mass, but also as we go outside, as we go out into the daily life, as we're in the world. One of the other things that we can also reflect upon that shows up in today's Gospel and is a necessary component of remembering is the fact that Our Lady was unable to conceive the Word of God by human nature. This is not something that happens in the normal process. The normal process of conceiving is something between a husband and wife. This birth takes place, and this conception of the Word of God inside the womb of Mary takes place by the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit. Now, we cannot have any recollection of what God has done without the Holy Spirit. Just as she needed the Holy Spirit to overshadow her so that the Word of God could be conceived in her womb, we too need the coming of the Holy Spirit this is part of the gift of our baptism. It's the essential part of the gift of confirmation. When the Holy Spirit is given to us so that we can then take in this word. The Holy Spirit is necessary even for us to say that Jesus is Lord. We can't even say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. As St. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3. So also... We cannot recognize the words of Scripture without the Holy Spirit. I attended graduate school and 
One of my professors, very well versed in scripture, taught it for years, taught the Hebrew language, and had classes and seminars for graduate students working on their doctorates. But he had lost his faith in Christ, and to him, everything in the Bible was just something to study, to make a living, to become famous, but it did not call him to a transformation of life because the Holy Spirit was not someone he wanted to affect him. He didn't want to see this as the Word of God. And another professor who came to visit my class when I was in the seminary was one of the most, as a matter of fact at the time, he was the world's expert on the Gospel of Mark, but he also was a complete atheist, as he told us in class. He said, I lost my faith in the, during World War II in the trenches of North Africa. And he never regained it, and yet he taught the gospel inside and out, but only as a piece of literature. It requires the Holy Spirit to be able to come inside our hearts so that we can respond to this as God's word, exactly as the Blessed Virgin Mary had done. Without that spirit, we can make no response except of intellect and say that this is an idea here or an idea there, but it can't give us a life that leads to eternity unless the Holy Spirit is there to overshadow us just as he overshadowed Mary. And besides that, nobody was able to write in the scripture unless the Holy Spirit had inspired them. That's why, again, to quote what we will say in the Creed, we believe in the Holy Spirit who has spoken through the prophet. We believe that the prophets of the Old Testament were inspired by God's Holy Spirit. We see that throughout. We believe that the authors of the New Testament were inspired by the Holy Spirit. He worked with them, using them as human beings, but at the same time giving them the words to say, inspiring this in their hearts. So we need him to get the word of God in the first place, and we need him to understand the word of God as God's word, just as Mary needed the Holy Spirit to be able to conceive the word within her, so that we look forward to the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit so that we can understand and comprehend this as the Word of God. And I tell you, the more that we do that, the more we open our hearts to this gift of the Holy Spirit that comes upon us when we read Scripture, the more depths that we will find, no matter how many times I read the Scripture, no matter how many times I go back to it again and again, I find new levels of depth new connections that I never thought of before. And this is something that we have to entrust to the Holy Spirit. Now all of this is very much in keeping with our Lord's words in the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 22, verse 19, where Jesus said, Do this in memory of me. This memory, this memory of the Word of God, such as Our Lady had, this calling to mind the great deeds of God that we must do. This is something that Jesus commanded of us. And that the Eucharist itself is about this remembering. There is certainly that element. And that's why we can't have any divisions and schisms amongst us. Instead, this memory provides us with a fundamental identity, as Pope John Paul had said our memory as a people of God gives us identity. Our memory as a church comes from, especially from the scripture and from the readings that we have of the saints and of the great stories that we have of the history of the church. All of this is our identity. If we forget or if we stop calling these things to mind, we lose our identity as Christians as some of these professors I describe have. 
and as many others do. How many of our people are ignorant of Scripture? Not only among Catholics. Protestant ministers complain about the same thing. And we look in our society where Scripture is not allowed to be included in some of the schools, certainly the public schools. Our memory as a culture is being made to disappear with that. We will lose who we are because our whole culture, our society, as a Christian society, has Scripture and the history of salvation as its identity. And they are trying to change our identity. This is something that we will not sit and, uh, for at all. We will stand up for Christ. So that, as we'll be saying here, do this in my memory of me, in the Eucharist. This is something that certainly guided Our Lady, certainly something that guides us. And in this way, we can find out truly who we are as human beings. We can find out our deepest identity, which is to be made in the image and likeness of God, as the book of Genesis proclaimed. We find out that we are not going to find an identity from politics and economics and sociology primarily. These are nice tools for certain things, but our identity, who we truly are before God and who we are for all eternity, is going to come by remembering the words that Moses left us, the words that the prophets left us, the words that Our Lady gave the apostles and have become the scripture, the words of the whole of the New Testament, the words of the whole history of our church, our saints, our martyrs, and as these become our words, our memory, and our identity in God, we pass them on to the next generation so that they too can have their identity in the same God. It's a great joy to be able to spend this Christmas Eve here in Bethlehem and to celebrate this Mass of Christmas and the birth of our Savior Jesus so close to where he was born. We are, of course, just down the street a little bit from the Church of the Nativity, a stable, a place for people who work and for animals, not a place for giving birth. And yet, even in the fact that our Lord was born in a stable here in Bethlehem, and that his first visitors were poor laborers themselves, the shepherds, we see that St. Paul's words in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 are brought to bear when he wrote that he, left behind the riches of heaven and made himself poor so that he might make us rich. What a powerful way to understand what happens here in Bethlehem. He made himself poor so that he might make us rich. He's going to come down to our level here in Bethlehem, and truly experience all that it means to be human. Unlike the gods in the mythologies where they just play acted at being man, they would play act at looking like humans and then change shape and go right back to their divinity, causing mischief and pain for people but never taking it seriously. No, that's not at all what we believe. Rather, along with St. Paul in Philippians chapter 2, we see that our Lord emptied himself of the glory of heaven. He emptied himself of the glory of heaven and did not cling to being equal to God so that 
he might become a slave even to the point of dying on the cross. And again, being born here in Bethlehem is one very important element of Christ's emptying of himself. Now one of the things that we also see here in this particular church, the church known as the Milk Grotto, is a very important way to enter more deeply into the mystery of Christ emptying himself for us. This mystery by which he empties himself of the riches of heaven in order to make us rich. First of all, what does Bethlehem mean? Beit is the Hebrew word for house. Lechem is the Hebrew word for bread. So this place is known as the house of bread. Then, we also see that it's especially famous for being the birthplace of David and his family. To this Bethlehem, Naomi came, and Ruth joined her in order to worship her God and to be in her house and to have the same people. And from Ruth comes David's great-grandfather and then the rest of the family. But it's because in this place, David, the youngest son, not the good-looking, tall, older son, or any of the other sons, but it's David, the youngest son, who is chosen by the prophet Samuel to be anointed to replace King Saul. Most unlikely kind of shepherd to replace a king. And yet, this is going to be God's doing. God pouring out his spirit upon David and retracting it from Saul. And then this place becomes the focus of so many prophecies. It's in the 720s B.C. that the prophet Micah says that the Messiah would be born here in Bethlehem. And just over 700 years later, it happens. The Messiah is born here. Not because the Blessed Virgin said, you know, Joseph, I'm bearing the Messiah, and we should go down to fulfill the prophecy. That had nothing to do with it, did it? It's simply obeying Caesar, who wants to enroll everybody in order to take taxes. And that circumstance is what brings them down to this place so that they might fulfill these prophecies. They're not trying to manipulate the scriptures or history. But in the way that history forces them to do which is, that which is painful and difficult, our Lady and St. Joseph come here and the prophecies are fulfilled. Then, we also see that this birth happens, again as we see in the poverty, and then after the birth, Our Lady doesn't stay with the animals. They don't live there. Of course they want to come to a place where they can have a little more quiet than donkeys and oxen will provide a little better aroma than they certainly would provide, and come to a place where they can stay for a while as Mary and the, her child begin to enter into that bonding that belongs so precisely between mother and child, that unique relationship. While mother might have many children, a child has only one mother. And that bonding and that relationship develops, especially in that process of holding and feeding and nourishing. So here at the Milk Grotto, we especially celebrate Our Lady giving that first nourishment to Christ. The thing that every baby has an instinct for. And Christ truly being born one of us. Not play acting at it, but being born one of us has the same human instinct that every child has to suckle, to receive its mother's milk. 
And so here we see all these images of Our Lady nursing Christ and giving her or giving him the nourishment, providing him with the milk he needs so that he can grow. Without that, he could not grow. Without that gift that comes from her own body, he cannot develop. And of course, like mothers through history and around the world, she has a great delight in letting her child nurse at her breasts to give of her life, not only having borne him in her womb, but to give of her own life. The food that she eats will be transformed into food that can feed him. She gives of her own body so that his body can grow. And it's for this reason that St. Augustine wrote many centuries ago, a wonderful line that has intrigued me since I first read it. She gave milk to our bread. Our Lady gave milk to our Christ who was born in the house of bread in Bethlehem. She gave milk to Christ who is our living bread to Christ who is the bread of life. Christ who is going to give us his body so that we can grow for eternal life, here in this place receives milk from the body of the Blessed Virgin Mary so that she can give him life. And the process of our eternal redemption is beginning here in so many ways, that communication of life from one's own self, not life as something out there, not something that you can buy, but rather something that comes from the very depths of the person and the milk that Our Lady gave from her own body is already a sign of that when Christ gives us his own body to nourish us to his own blood so that we can have eternal life with God in heaven. This is the beginning of the gift. And this to me is one of the most important connections of Our Lady with the Holy Eucharist. We see that nourishment taking place so that we can be nourished. But then there's going to be something else that is called for from us. If we are going to be nourished by receiving the body of Christ as he was nourished by receiving the milk of his mother, and if we are going to be given this gift of himself, not something out there, but himself, then what is it going to mean for us who are made in his image and likeness we are also going to be called to give of ourselves back. We don't just give things. We give who we are. We give our own personalities, the depths of our identity, first to God. As Jesus himself would teach, you must love the Lord your God with your whole heart, your whole mind, your whole body, your whole self. We give ourselves to God. But not only do we give ourselves to God, but he is calling us then to be able to give of ourselves to one another. Our love will never be the bestowal of items and external things, but it will be the donation of our very lives. And in this way, we don't just receive the mystery of Christmas. We don't just meditate upon it. But here we begin to live out that mystery of Christmas, that mystery of self-gift, even to the point of making ourselves poor for the sake of others, so that salvation can be not only within our lives, not only for our eternal life, but also for the whole church and by God's grace to the whole world. Oh.